Welcome back, humor consumers, to the Life Happens Laugh Anyway podcast. I'm comedian Tracy DeGraff. And I'm Catherine, co-host and bestie. Welcome to the Pod Lab on a Sunday, Catherine. Yeah, we don't do this on Sundays usually. No, we don't. No. But here we are on Sunday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a beautiful morning of worship. Yeah, we did. Uh, the end of our VBS week, which was great. Yeah. So much fun. I love VBS week. I love when we get to see the, you know, all the pictures put together in a slide. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It was. It was a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the whole team there at Christ Community Church in Piatone, Illinois. You know, yeah. we're a small church, but a, a true community church. Where, you know, everybody kind of rolls up their sleeves and does stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. It was fantastic. And if uh, anybody's listening that was a part of that, a big shout out to you because we love our faith family. And if you're looking for a church in the Piatone, Illinois area, Christ Community Church is a wonderful place to grow in your faith. So we would encourage you to have connection with us there. Indeed. Okay. That being said, welcome to episode number 183. Yeah. Kind of amazing right. that, that we're that far. And today's episode is titled Hillbilly Elegy and the Effects of Addiction. Right. And yeah. spoiler alert, we are going to tell you what happened in the movie Hillbilly Elegy. Yes. So if you haven't seen it yet and you don't want to know what it's about, go watch it and then come back and listen to us talk about it. Mm-hmm. But we're, you know, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to say the whole thing. I mean, we're going to say what we remember. Which, <laughs> right. <laughs> but I would think that it would be fine for them to listen to us talk about it as well and then go back and watch it later. Uh, yeah. A lot of people already know the story and the conclusion. Yeah. But um, we're, we're just going to take a chunk out of it and chew it up and talk about it. Yeah, and we have, um, we have a couple of takeaways, and I'll get to that in a second. But I do want to give a little shout out to our sponsors. We have sponsors on this podcast whom we are grateful for. Yes, very. To whom we are grateful. I don't think I'm supposed to end a sentence with four. No, I know. We okay. can't. It's a preposition. Yeah, I'm sorry, Wendy Massett. <laughs> Wendy can't. can't Wendy can't, helps my me mom out. is like that too. No, you cannot end with at for oh, on. I know. I know. Even in your mom's condition, yes. I mean, maybe she not. Winces. Yeah, maybe she can't say what she's thinking, but I know. Oh, she sure can understand it. <laughs> right at where because, you at? Yeah, because oh, she just sorry. gets nuts. Okay. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors. We have many sponsors on Patreon. And Catherine, if somebody's listening for the very first time, please just give them a little synopsis about what the sponsorship program is about. Well, it's about putting this podcast forward and also the ministry of Life Happens, Laugh Anyway. And the um, typically $5 a month that just automatically deducted from Patreon, if if you do it that way, um, just goes toward advancing that. And so we appreciate um, or we appreciate what we already have. But if you're listening and you would like, you're you're just on that fence. Like, should I or shouldn't I? You should. You should. You should. (laughs) We're we're two broke girls. We are. (laughs) And we're getting there. I mean, I'm going to read this list because it's not really that long. But I'm going to read. These are the first names of those who are currently sponsoring us with their five American dollars every single month. Oh, I'm so glad we're naming them. So thank you so much to Valerie and Sarah, Wendy, Jess, another Jessica, Katie, Colleen, Ursula, Nancy, Kenny, Karen, Janine, Muffin, Darlene. (laughs) Everybody knows who Muffin is. That's my man. Darlene, Courtney, and Joan. Those are all of our recurring giving partners. They're our humor contributors. It's thanks to them that really anybody can hear our voices. That's right. Because we started out with just two sponsors, and that was Muffin and Pooh, our husbands. Mm -hmm. Puffin. (laughs) For short. Yeah. It's been a while since we've said that. Yeah, it has been because we have all these others now, and and Puffin are very grateful that they're not the only ones sponsoring anymore. And we also have contributors that give a one lump sum, like Gail and Linda, and who else has given? Carla, my friend from high school. Um, Janine gives now with a one lump sum. Yeah. So does. Bev. Okay. Uh, Does Christine? Christine. There's somebody else that um, is your friend. I thought she did as well. Uh, yeah, you know what? I don't remember, and they're not on this list. So if you have given to us, we appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you so much. We love you. Oh 
do. We, we do. And we appreciate that. So if, if you would miss us if we were gone, just go on to Patreon and throw us some love. <laughs> throw us some $5 a month love. It's 60 bucks a year. That's, that's pretty good. All right. Let's get into uh, the episode. Okay. All right. Um, the takeaways, we're going to do a review of the 2020 Netflix film. It's a Ron Howard film called Hillbilly Elegy, based on a best-selling book. And it's the true life story of now Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give a review of that and, you know, what our takeaways were. Our thoughts on addiction. Mm -hmm. You're going to share your thoughts on addiction. I'm going to share my thoughts on addiction. And finally, we're going to share how we can all improve our situation right now in regard to addiction. Right. Okay. Yeah. Then we'll have our scripture. As always, we have our our call to action and our inspirational scripture. So stay tuned all the way to the end. Catherine, give me a little synopsis. You're good at this. You're good at summarizing things. So if somebody's never heard of Hillbilly Elegy, Mm -hmm. tell them the summary. Well, as you pointed out, it's the true story and it's a memoir of J.D. Vance. And uh, it opens up with uh, 2011 and it kind of toggles between... Uh, him in 2011 and back to 1997 and uh, it's his life with his um, family and it's between Kentucky and Ohio because he lived in in two places and that that's because of family history where the grandparents grew up and then where they moved to right so they would spend summers in Kentucky and it it gave us quite the glimpse of his life with his mom with addiction and his grandparents involvement in his life and his sister too Uh, they show how close he was with his older sister Lindsay I believe yeah right and it shows how what he came from and how he got to where he was in the opening of the movie, which is at a, a dinner meeting at Yale University, and how he's really hoping for um, an interview to for an internship for a job that he really needs. Because at this point in his life, he's holding down three jobs. He's got a mother who's addicted to, um, well, previously it was prescription drugs she she was a nurse and somehow she got into you know um stealing the yeah Mm -hmm. stealing the medication and her erratic behavior is a big part of of the movie and and um it, it 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 just shows his journey during that time it doesn't show so much um, I guess in the book, there's a little bit more about political stuff mm-hmm. and views. Um, and, but this is more about the, the family drama and his um, rise to where he gets to be mm-hmm. and that pull of um, his mother's addiction and the family dynamics. And one thing that I really loved was a takeaway, and I feel like it was really driven in there too, besides just, just keep going, was that family family is so important and that it kind of opens also with uh this his message of you stick up for your family yeah and so that was um like it seems to be a core of his belief um amongst also don't forget where you came from and uh where your roots are but uh, but know that you can also go where you you want to go you know you can become who you want to become yeah and it was so interesting to me to see the Kentucky portion of where he you know had those roots in the Appalachian people Mm -hmm. you know I mean just their loyalty to family but yet at the same time they seemed to have these challenges within families just like it seemed like for oh, everyday yeah. life was a struggle right you know the extreme poverty and i i would even say in a word chaos it seemed oh, like for sure. there was so much chaos in their lifestyle and and simultaneously he says because he also narrates it or somebody does you know um in the movie and he says but this is where i this is what i really consider home even though i lived in ohio and that's where i live now kentucky is where i was most um at home and comfortable so um obviously he feels that pull 
and you know maybe maybe it's because that's where um it was summer and that's where they did all, all kinds of you know things you do in the summer the barbecues the well yeah and you know the one scene where he was in the swimming hole that was like at the very beginning yep. when mm-hmm. he's riding his bike and and his one of his relatives said where are you going i'm going to the swimming hole and mm-hmm. he gets there to the swimming hole and he's swimming, and these other boys were making fun of him and yeah, trying like to bullies. dunk him under the water and almost drown him. Mm-hmm. And and then when he popped up out of the water and got out of the swimming hole, he went after them. Well, then they, you know, they they went after him too. And then JD's people, his family, his grandfather came up mm-hmm. and stood up for him and told those other boys, you know, what for and all that and found out who they were and said, I'm going to talk to your father and all this stuff. Yeah. So really the sense of clan, you know, this is my group. This is my, this is my team. Right. I'm, I'm protected here. I could see why he said that that really felt like home to him because first of all, his age. Yeah. The vulnerable situation that he was in, in his own home. Mm Mm-hmm. But yet there's that fierce it's, loyalty there is that's right all along and even though his mom had erratic behavior and there was also you you got the you you were able to pick up on as a viewer that there's there's this love too. his mom who she is besides the addiction was there too and so yeah. you, you feel that in the movie because um, in certain scenes, he can talk to his mom like you'd be able to talk to anybody else. But then she has these explosive moments, and um, that's the other side of her. But I guess all that to say that there's there's an underlying um, strong sense of bonding amongst all of them. Yeah, in spite of in spite the of. craziness. And the mom, Beverly, she was played by Amy Adams. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I thought she did an amazing she job. She did an amazing job. Uh she looked the part and she so did. did Glenn Close, which was Mi Me- Ma, yeah. the grandma, which would would have been Bev's mother. Yeah. She was I love when older women get uh roles like well any role really But when they nail it, I love it. And Glenn Close is a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And she was unrecognizable as Mama. Kenny said, I said to Kenny, I said, that's Glenn Close. He goes, no. (laughs) I said, yes, it is. And you could tell that Mama had lived life hard. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was the the picture that you got. As well as Amy Adams, you Mm -hmm. know, that's her last name, right? Adams? Adams, yeah. Okay, That, that her character had been living life hard just making choices life choices that were making life harder than it actually even was yeah you know they were already in a hard situation one of the questions that I have for you because as Ron and I were watching it last night I kept saying over and over I I just am trying to figure out how much of Beverly's addiction like was her personality so chaotic maybe she was bipolar I don't know what her if she had any kind of a mental diagnosis but was it her circumstances and her personality that drove her to the drugs or was it the drugs that drove her to that chaotic behavior well the movie I don't know what the book says but the movie indicated how uh what she witnessed um before her grandfather became sober and um, so that was going to be one of my bullet points of Mine you and too. I. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, tragedy sticks out. So at a moment in the movie where J.D. is talking to his sister and he's so mad at his mom and her decisions. Yeah. And why can't she beat this? Why can't she be normal? And the sister says, J.D., she had it worse than we do yeah you don't know what you don't know exactly and then she tells him and that's when you see the scenes and at one point the grandma Mima, had lit fire to her husband uh when he was in a drunken state at one point right and the girls the sisters so this this would have been bev and her sister watched it and put the fire out over their own father so i think or at least what i picked up on it we do know for sure that bev was a very intelligent woman yeah so jd's mom was very smart she was she could have really gone places um she got pregnant early and then she had to put herself 
uh, you know, she wasn't married, I mean, and she had to put herself through nursing school. So we know this. We know she's highly intelligent. We know she had a volatile background um, and, you know, poor community. Um but did she have a mental illness? I, I they, it, they didn't indicate that. I think it was right. um, more they're trying to show what the drugs did to her. Yeah. Uh, so I, being that they didn't show any kind of mental illness in the movie makes me think. I don't want to assume, but. Right. Uh, so we did ask each other mm-hmm. to write down scenes that stood out. And so obviously you and I both confess to each other that we both wrote down that scene because that really did that was at a point in the movie because before you see mama starting papa on fire Mm -hmm. right they're together they're still married he seems pretty chill and he seems pretty level-headed right like a like a calm in the storm type of thing and that was a point in the movie where I went wow right the only indication that there had been trouble in their marriage previously was Mima at at one point tells young JD that well why do you think we live down the street from each other and because JD said something like am I like my um, mom Right. And she says, no, you're more like me. Right. Your mom is more like your papa. Yeah. And so that was one indication that, hmm, because I was like, oh, what What does that mean? To what degree did he have an addiction and why does he live down the street? Yeah. So that was the only indication because when papa died, um, mama, it's so hard for me to talk like that. Mama, mama, mama. she's devastated and she grieves heavily over his coffin. So, you know, I have to say now that I know what I know about their earlier marriage, I feel like I would have so much anger and bitterness toward that, but he does become sober, I guess. So there was time to heal too, I guess, you know, and that was uh, segueing into another scene that was meaningful to me that I thought was great in the movie. When mm-hmm. you talk, okay, so you're talking about Mama when she's grieving over Papa. Mm-hmm. The scene where the funeral procession was going past and everybody in town was yes. removing their hats. Oh yes, lowering their heads. Ooh, Ooh I got the chills. They, and then uh, JD says to Mama, why do they do that? Mm-hmm. And she says, it's the, the way that because you're from the hills. Hill, hill and country. this is the way that people from the hills respect their dead yes. and honor their dead. Which that reminds me, the opening scene of the movie, there, there's a sermon on the radio going on in the background. Uh, so they're in the Bible Belt. And the, the grandma, even though she is rough around the edges, she is a deep faithful person yeah they don't show that a lot in the movie i will say but um she, but she is i mean she's you know uh she is who she is i'm not gonna go into that but yeah they, they come from the hollers that's yeah. that's their people yeah. and that is a good thing to point out that's right yeah i just found that really interesting and i wondered if it had super spiritual roots i don't know and i didn't investigate that but i just was mindful of it. Mm-hmm. And I do think that it's something that we should all be mindful of in terms of respect, honor, um, and just the reality that this earth, our time on this earth is so brief. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go over my sure. three sure. that I have. So I kind of lumped together in one kind of bullet point, the Bev's erratic behavior when, um, she she brings home well the boyfriend brings home a dog for young JD, and it's like, it's like this happy moment right before that they're doing some Easter egg coloring or yeah, whatever yeah. they're doing a craft, and then the, the the dog comes in and in a in a nanosecond, uh, Bev snaps and she goes the opposite way and she's screaming at, uh, not only I mean she brings the dog in and yet yells about the dog and and so that to me was so uncomfortable to watch right. because I hate when I see somebody go from zero to 90 you know it, it just it goes right through me that's and, why it made me wonder about her mental like like capacity to be able to even handle an emotion yeah but she was she was trying to be clean from what I, the way I took it was that this this was a period of time she's trying to be clean and she just can't handle it. 
she's like having the withdrawals or whatever they call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then th- when she threatens, there she's in the car with JD, and they had been into an argument. And she threatens to crash the car, and she's trying to beat on him. Um, and then of course when Grandma. Mima and JD were in their house and then they hear commotion down the street and the, the Mima says to JD oh it's some crazy person down the street there's always something and it's his mother yeah so I lumped those together sorry that's okay <laughs> in terms of because it just went right through me but um, another one that really stuck out to me was Mima's revelation when she was in the hospital with pneumonia and she was, she had just learned that uh, JD was doing poor in school and that he was getting into trouble himself. He he was a real good boy. She always encouraged him to keep up good grades and, right. and all of this. But then when she's in the hospital and she learns that he is hanging around the wrong people, um, she's laying there and she's remembering some words that JD said to her. Because there was a moment when he was really upset with her, and he said, "You were you were bad mother, and so is my mom." Yeah, and he had said that because uh, because the way he saw it, Mima did not uh, intervene as much as she should have with the mother's addiction. She enabled her daughters. She was she an enabler. Enabled a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. which it, is very common. Yes, right. So she makes this decision right there in that hospital bed to get up pull out the IVs or whatever she did yeah, and go and get that boy, JD. Yeah. And she brings him back to her, uh, her place, her house. And it's tough love. Like she said, are those your friends? No, they're not anymore. Get out. Get out. <laughs> she asks the two other boys hanging out on the porch, a couple questions and they answer her and she's like, yeah, get out. Didn't and- she ask them if they could spell something? I thought yeah. she asked them to spell Mississippi or something. Yes, she did. One of them, she and he, asked and that. And he couldn't do it. And she's like, you're out. Get yes. out. <laughs> yes. And she said, asked her, said something. Or what nationality are you? Oh, she said something about his nationality. <laughs> <laughs> she asked him his name and he gave it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she made some crude remark. But, but, uh, but to her credit, right, here's this woman. She actually, Mama got pregnant at 13. Is it 13? She was 13 when I knew she, she got pregnant. Yeah. 13. Yikes. When she got pregnant. And then Beverly got pregnant at 18. Yeah. Okay. So credit to Mama that she actually then saw the writing on the wall and she thought, by golly, not on my watch. You know, I've mm-hmm. seen all this destruction. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm improvising, you know, like I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I felt like she was saying, I've seen this the way that this ends. Mm-hmm. I know the end of this story. Mm-hmm. I have a right and a responsibility to change it. Exactly. And I wonder, too, if she laid off, like, she wasn't as driven to take care of JD in the term, in terms of taking over. I wonder if it's because he was doing okay. And so was Lindsay. Yeah. They weren't into trouble. But once she learned that, she thought, I'm ending this cycle. I I think. Well, and I think that she also, because JD did want to go live with Mama way before. Yes. Remember that? Yes. And she said, no, that can't happen. I can't do that to Bev. I can't do that to your mother. Because Bev really loved her children. She did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying but. She loved them and at the same time, she had this terrible addiction. Yeah. You know, one of the things, Catherine... Well, first of all, can we segue now into the effects of addiction, or did you want to say anything else? I did want to say a you little go ahead. bit more. You go ahead, because and I've got this other thing to say. I just can't help it. <laughs> okay, go My ahead. other really thing that really got to me, um, in, in even now, I've got the chills because yeah. it just went right through me. Sure. Uh, toward the end of the movie, and JD has an interview the very next day for a very important position, and he needs it. He's holding three jobs. He's, you know, trying to get ahead. And um, they're and then they're miles away. It's Washington D.C. to Ohio yeah. that he's got to travel. And his mom had had a heroin overdose, and his sister Lindsay it has been you know holding the reins like all this time and and um, while he's at school, and she cannot bring the mother back 
to her home and uh, the mother refused, Bev, his mom, refused to go to this rehab place. So Mm -hmm. there's no other choice but to get her a room in a hotel and he's staying with her. He left for a few minutes to get some food for her that she asked for. He comes back. She's in the bathroom trying to get high. And Mm -hmm. so here, now here's where I'm getting at. So gets her onto the bed. He flushes the drugs down the toilet and whatever he does. Now he's torn. If I leave again, she might overdose. Yeah. But I've got this interview. And they show what he's thinking by showing scenes of like what his future could be like and where he is now. And her, and meanwhile, the mom is holding her hand out, like, stay with me. And she says, stay with me and, yeah. and hold her hand, just like she did when he was younger. He did stay with her and held her hand. But he comes to this revelation of, he's like, mom, I love you. I'm not going to be any help here. Yeah. Can't do much here. So he decides to leave her and uh, go to Washington for this for this interview. And that really... Um, stuck out to me a lot too because I can't imagine the pull I maybe I can be think about that pull of the mom needing the help and him having this opportunity to not only advance himself but to to make a difference yeah by having this job it's heartbreaking to think about children who grow up in addiction and the thought of the weight of the world on his shoulders. Absolutely. And speaking of that, another time that he defended his mom when she tried to crash him and then he ends up, he somehow they get to uh, a person's home and he barges into the home. He's like, help me, help me to this woman. And the woman tries to help. The police are called. The police come. By then, Mima, Papa, and um, are, they're all there on the yep. scene. And yeah, and Lindsay. And the police say to young JD, they say, you need to press charges. What happened here? Uh, and JD says, nothing happened here. Nothing happened here. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. The cop says to him, you realize this is this is not normal. Right. Okay, you can make a difference, your mom, and help her if you just say what really happened here. And he continues to say, "No, nothing happened." But I think that was because he had been told family sticks together. Yeah. And you so. And that, Mama and Papa, they both commended JD they for did. what a good boy he was. They did in getting in line, you know, mm-hmm. and defending the family. Yeah. And, and right. I also would like to point out, too, that the point where the daughter is trying to better herself, Bev, his mother, and she has this, um, she wants to pass her nursing board again so she could be a nurse again. And she needs a clean urine sample. And of course, JD is upset about not having, why don't you have a clean urine sample, he asks. Of your own, from right. your own bladder. Right. Yeah. And you could tell that Mima is hesitating because she's there during this part of this conversation and the Mima says to JD just give her the sample and you could tell she's hesitant yeah but and JD's upset like I can't believe you're asking me to do this um I can't imagine the pull that her mother the Mima felt at that time but yeah she did go ahead and encourage him to do it he did do it the the urine sample my heart was broken also for Mima Mama, whatever you call her, for the grandma, for going closest character. Mm-hmm. It was broken for her, too, because obviously yeah. we learned all the things that she experienced, mm-hmm. right? And being pregnant at 13 couldn't have been a, a walk in the park, okay? <laughs> then, you you know, you have this baby, and mm-hmm. now you're raising this baby. You're a baby yourself, mm-hmm. and you're in this culture and in this environment. Um, and then when you witness all this stuff that your daughter is doing and and maybe she was just thinking oh if only if only Bev could get this one clean urine sample and get her life together right this time it could be different right. you know maybe she was just thinking I'm just doing this to try to help my child right what I, I, what did you think about the scene where they flash back to Mima as a very young person. Yeah. And she's running in the woods away from something. What what was your thought on that? What do you think that was indicating? Um I didn't really have a thought about that particular scene, 
but I was just thinking in terms of being so young and sexually active and at that time in life, hmm. you know, um, I just thought of, and, and then being pregnant at the age of 13, that just, it, it just kind of dominated my thoughts on her character from what the challenges yeah. would be in her entire adult life. Hmm. I, I thought that it was indicating that um, she had been raped. If she's running in the woods away from something. She looks about 13, and they had just said in the narration or some or something or the, in the scene before that that she got pregnant at 13. Yeah. So I thought perhaps she was raped, even though she had her boyfriend, which was her yeah, husband. Yeah, I thought, though, that they would have said that. I think I, that they would have revealed that if that was the case. Yeah, I mean, maybe. that's a big detail to leave out and just to leave to the brain to wonder, you know, your imagination. Yeah, it's been done before, but well, I'm just, yeah, I think that it would be a detail that they would have probably shared. But what do I know? Mm. Any other thoughts about the scenes that stuck stuck out to you? Not at the moment. Um, I had similar the one about um, the JD being threatened in the car that mom was going to kill him. I mean, that was just so sad. Mm -hmm. All right, let's transition into our thoughts on addiction. What say you about what, like what kind of thoughts were you having as you're watching the movie about the topic of addiction? I'm extremely afraid of it. I, I can barely watch movies where people are addicted to drugs. (laughs) I hate to say this or admit this. I can watch movies where people are murdered things but addiction i i can barely watch it It, i and sometimes i have to cover my eyes um and i was also thinking about um people i know of who have been in the medical profession who have become addicted so i was thinking about that and i was thinking about um those that i know of who have become victims of addiction period and deeply grieved, deeply troubled. Mm. I'm extremely concerned about what our uh, future leaders and people in positions who can make a difference, um, what they're going to do uh, in terms of the opioid crisis and the, that whole problem. Uh, that's my thoughts on it. Just deeply sorrowed. Um, it, it, I just hate how... Drugs change people from what they were created to be. Yeah. And they completely alter a person. Yeah. So, and I, I also am so troubled by the uh, generational, you know, problem with that, that it just goes down sometimes, generations. So deep. It, it does. Um, so that's, that's my thought on it. Yeah. Um, that those are the things I was thinking about when I was watching the movie just like it's just so deeply troubled yeah I agree with everything that you said um one of the things that makes me question when you just said that about generational addiction I'm curious is there a genetic component is there something that makes certain genes more susceptible to addiction than others is it lifestyle you know, and culture that is affecting it and, mm-hmm. and influencing it? Mm-hmm. Or is it a combination of the two? Right. I don't know. It seems to be the age-old question. There's, like, been so many things said about it that some say yes and others say mm, it's both. Yeah. Um, both it, meaning environmental. Right. And- I would say this, too, about addiction because there are many things that we can be addicted to. Mm-hmm. Many things, right? Mm-hmm smoking nicotine even if it's not smoking you could be addicted to nicotine to the gum or to the Mm -hmm. whatever you put in your mouth um caffeine uh so many of us i'm addicted to caffeine if i don't have caffeine i get a headache that's Mm -hmm. a sign that i that i i'm addicted (laughs) to it uh food Mm -hmm. you know sugar uh, of course, drugs and alcohol, sex. Mm-hmm. There are so- shopping, gambling. I was just about to say thrifting. <laughs> I'm addicted to thrifting. You can. Uh, yeah. Okay. And we do kind of scoff off it. Like we laugh. Like, haha, that's so funny, right? Video gaming. I, I believe that that addiction alone uh. is something that is changing the trajectory of our culture. Yeah, okay? I do too. So that in mind, um, stay tuned till the very end because we are going to share a little bit more about that. But myself, my own 
thoughts when I'm watching the movie and watching the film. You know, you know this about me that I grew up in a home with addiction. Mm -hmm. My dad was addicted to alcohol Mm -hmm. from the time I was born until I was about 13. He went through Alcoholics Anonymous and never touched another drink of alcohol for the rest of his life. It's commendable. Very much so. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this growing up, not knowing any different, like when the cops said to him, you know, this isn't normal, right? Yeah. Not knowing any different. If you grow up in a certain environment, you just think that it's normal. Yeah. You just think that's what everybody does. Yeah. Or, or even if you have a slight indication that, no, something's not right here, it still is normal. It's exactly. Like, it's hard to explain. And on top of that, there's, you know, the connection between dad and daughter, mother and son, whatever. The connection that you have with your parents, even though there may be chaos right. around the addiction, <laughs> and there definitely was chaos mm-hmm. around my father's mm-hmm. addiction. But most of the time, he would be so lights out, you know, he mm-hmm. didn't know what, what happened. Mm-hmm. Or even at the, you know, after he had recovered from being a, a active alcoholic, you know, and, and he was no longer drinking, he didn't know the impact right. that his disease or addiction or whatever you want to call it had on the people around him. So that's one of the things that I took away from the film is watching young JD being in those different settings. I could remember young Tracy, right, mm. being in a situation where my dad was scary. And Ron asked me, he said, well, what what was the thing about growing up in an addicted home? I said, it was just... I was terrified all the time. Down predictable. When they go from point A to point B in seconds flat, you don't know what to expect when you get home right. or when they're coming home. Right. And the other thing for me was my friends wouldn't come over. And I didn't want my friends over. Yeah. You know? So so addiction has a rippling effect that permeates everyone around it. Yeah. And you like I can both say too that yes it was hard and I wish it hadn't happened and I I wish that I could have grown up with the dad that I had from 13 on mm-hmm. you know because of course I've had to I've had to forgive him for things mm-hmm. be, you know without him ever asking for forgiveness because he really wasn't aware of mm-hmm. what happened mm-hmm. you know what I mean So just to encourage anybody that's listening, if you grew up in a situation where there was addiction of any kind or chaos or that sort of, if if this resonates with you, forgiveness is totally possible without ever seeing an acknowledgement of the pain that you went through or whatever. And it's healthy for us. Or even a change. Right. Even if the person doesn't change at all. I mean, I've had friends whose parents died in alcoholism, Mm -hmm. in active, full-blown alcoholism. It was so hard and painful. Mm -hmm. Um, And and my encouragement to anybody listening who um, has grown up like that, you definitely know that you've been affected by it. The best way to prevent that from repeating itself in your own life is to stay away from that stuff. Mm -hmm. Stay away. Yeah. If you never start drinking or smoking or doing a drug or gambling or whatever the addictive things are, it's just healthier. Yeah. The reason I just said prescription drugs out loud, because you said just stay away from X, Y, Z. Just this morning, I heard that 70% of people that are addicted to opioids started out as it was a prescription. So that's scary. It is. Yeah, um, I just, I'm just saddened by that. Or afraid of it. Yeah, like, and there are both. there are a lot of problems surrounding the topic of addiction. Mm-hmm. So it's really, really tough. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm looking at my notes here to see if there's anything else. Oh, well, one, one more thing. Okay. One more thing that I wanted to say about the person who is addicted. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I think... I could say this in my own life. I don't think my dad wanted to be in oh, that dark right. place. Oh, no. You know, you knew my father. Mm-hmm. He's passed away now. But mm-hmm. you knew my father Oh yeah. as a kind, generous, very encouraging very, man. He was a very big encourager, and for sure. And a positive thinker. And a helper. Oh, he, like, yeah. You know, just get me in there. Let me help you get... Uh, in a better position or whatever exactly. the case might be. For, yeah. Yes. That same man didn't want to be the one who was 
so addicted to alcohol no. that he was out of his mind drunk. Right. Okay. And so the curiosity to me is like, at what point does the addiction take over to where now you've lost control of what's happening? I don't know where that line is. Yeah. You know, like I, and I know that my father started drinking when he was in high school. He was actually kicked out of high school because he had liquor in his locker, you know, and and it just went went from there. Mm-hmm. And he and my mom got married young in their 20s. And then boom, 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 here's three kids. Mm-hmm. They're all in cloth diapers. I mean, that would drive you to <laughs> something, right? And and it was very difficult. But where was the line? Like, did he, did he always struggle with drinking? Or, you know, or do people just go, kind of go along and then pretty soon they're just into this habit of they have to have it? Yeah, I, I don't know because drinking, as far as I know, alcohol doesn't have like the same physical components that some of the opioid, opioids have. They make your body physically crave it. I don't know if alcohol does that. It does. Does it? Yeah. Okay. And it's actually, it might be a different level though because yeah. like when my dad came back from AA, mm-hmm. they recommended little bowls of um, hard candy. My mother would put out like a candy dish with hard, ca- hard candy in it mm-hmm. so that when he was feeling a craving, he could just pop some sugar in his mouth because alcohol is just sugar. Yeah. Um, anyway, I but, don't I don't know. And I know that different things have different levels yeah, of addiction. Look at this. I mean, this cell oh, phone, yeah, right. this cell phone mm-hmm. that I am holding up right now has a level of addiction to it that it I don't even think we're aware of. It and does. the dopamine hit yeah. that we get well, from checking our phone and seeing if anybody said anything, <laughs> you know. Who loves me? Who, 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 who's contacting me? me? Well, yeah. you mentioned video games. Yeah. And I know that video games are created to have a addictive component to it. Like, yes. like where you cannot stop. You have to keep going. Like, these kids, or not even kids anymore, They're because they're a lot of them are adults now um they'll sit there and not go to the bathroom and then have a little jug next to them and then (laughs) or like eating it's I don't even I don't even know all the stuff I just know that it's very hard for them to break away to go to the bathroom or to get a proper meal or whatever Yeah. yeah so it's um sobering and our encouragement to anybody that is still listening to this is just you know Hang in there. Yeah, I just want to use this quote as we're coming to a close. Yes. That um, in the uh, ending of the movie, it's supposed to be the voice of J.D. Vance. And he says, where we come from is who we are, but who we choose every day, who we, but we choose every day who we become. Yeah. Um, And I, I really liked that quote because it kind of, it kind of wraps up his story yeah so it does. that's yeah that it's not He's, a foregone conclusion that you're going to end you know with the same addictions that your parents had or the same difficulty that your parents had with straightening out life right but at the same time it who you are his his roots yeah. is who he is yeah um but it it doesn't mean that you can't grow and you can't become Right. Else, but you're, yeah. and, and just like I pointed out that my father was a great man mm-hmm. and you can't take that away from right. him. And he made, he put in the effort to make the change, mm-hmm. you know, and um, at his funeral, there were hundreds of people that came, yeah. people that he helped, mm-hmm. you know, when he, when he left alcohol for good, mm-hmm. he eventually then became a business agent in his local yeah, uh, the laborer local mm-hmm. that he was a part of. And as a business agent, he would go into the local bars and drag members <laughs> of his union off of the bar stool mm. and pull them out of the bar and say, hey, this is not going to help you in life. You wow. need to get your act together and get to work. Well, and good for the fact that your dad could go into a bar and not be tempted at that. He went into bars all the time. He would go into bars all wow. the time and just have Diet Coke. Wow. Yeah. I mean, once he was done, he was done. And then he eventually quit smoking, too. And he Mm. said quitting smoking was harder. 
mm-hmm. than quitting alcohol. Yeah, my dad had said how hard because that was. is a very yeah. addictive drug. And then and then when he got type two diabetes, he's like, I can't drink, I can't smoke. I, now I can't eat. My dad said the same thing. Oh yeah. gosh, yeah. But I I, and I I mean no disrespect to my father oh, because I know you don't. He was a great man mm-hmm. and. I give him all the credit that yeah. he did overcome that terrible addiction. By the way, J.D. Vance's mom, Bev, has been clean now for 10 years. Praise God. Mm-hmm. All right. We have a little scripture to share with everybody, mm-hmm. as we do every mm-hmm. week. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a cloud of great By a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I just got goosebumps. (laughs) I know. Woo! Ah! (laughs) I love God's word. Yeah. It's so encouraging. Yeah. Um, Anything else that you wanted to say? No. Okay. Um, I just love that that encourage, encouragement tells us that sin does entangle us, but there is a way out and Amen. it is possible. There is. And our call to action today is just keep going. Hmm. Do not give up. Mm-hmm. If you're struggling with any kind of an addiction or you're struggling with somebody else's addiction, forgive, move on, repent, get help, but don't give up. Yeah. Just keep going. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Well, you've been listening to the Life Happens Laugh Anyway podcast. I'm still comedian Tracy DeGraff. I'm still Catherine. We'll see you next Goodbye. time.